While this podcast platform typically explores the spiritual biographies of practitioners in Myanmar, along with delving into the different meditation traditions there, we have somewhat shifted our focus to respond to this current crisis. While we will definitely continue to interview guests who can share Buddhist perspectives and impart wisdom at this time of need, we will be expanding our work to talk with a wider range of speakers who can add to the breadth and depth of our coverage so that listeners can better understand the nature of the current crisis. And if there are additional topics or guests that you would like to suggest, please do so by writing us at info at insightmyanmar.org. With that, let's get on to our show. I'm here with John. She is in California joining us. She is originally from Myanmar and is going to share a bit of her background and perspective on the current situation. So uh, first of all, Jaw, I just would like to thank you for uh, being here, spending time with us in what I'm sure for all of us has been a bit of a difficult month. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Uh... Yeah, quite a difficult month, quite a difficult day, actually, because I yeah. woke up to the news you know, that says 54 people were killed today uh, in these protests. So you know, every day I feel like I'm waking up to something new. Yeah, so <laughs> it's been tough, but uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to share my thoughts and my experiences. Yeah. Right. So, uh, of course, this isn't going to be released right after we record. So mm -hmm. it'll be several more days of news by the time this yeah. is out there. We are working to have as quick a turnaround as we can with these events. But uh, I had the same reaction you did. I woke up as I do every morning, looked at my phone to see how bad the news was and hope all my friends were okay. And when I saw the same news you did, I cried in bed for about 20 minutes. And um, I cried so much that I had to use the sheets to wipe <laughs> the tears from my eyes, and um, and then I and then I just stayed there paralyzed for a little bit, um, unable to get up. So you know, we it's definitely a background that both of us have in the emotion of the um, of this interview was how hard the day was and how painful some of those those stories and pictures were. Yeah. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the days. Um, after this, we finish this recording when it will be released. But so we'll, we'll both do the best we can. Um, and with that, if we could switch, switch gears just for a moment and just uh, learn a little bit about you, about where you came from, what your story mm -hmm. is, how you ended up in sunny California. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I grew up, I was born and raised in Yungo um, in a township called Yangin. Both my parents where, you know, first generation college students really work their way up to be able to support us. Um, they were just both small business owners. So throughout, I, you know, just ordinary um, average Burmese childhood. Uh, I went to government schools all throughout, but very fortunately um, in my neighborhood, there was a teacher named Teacher Irene who taught English to me for free like throughout my whole life. So I started speaking English when I was three. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. very fortunate and a rare, op like a very rare opportunity that a lot of, you know, uh, Burmese kids don't get unless your parents are wealthy or you can afford to go to an international school. Yeah, so I was born and raised there um, after I finished my matriculation at 
exams in 10th grade, I went to a college called Yango University of Foreign L Languages for a year and a half. I was studying Korean with the hopes to maybe go to Korea one day and you know, study entertainment and whatnot. Um, but as I was in college, it's just, you know, there is something in me since I was a young girl that I didn't really fit in the mold of the government schools where they tell you to not ask questions. If they teach you one method, that's it. Um, so, you know, the part of me. Can you tell us a bit more about those schools? Because I think there's probably a lot of listeners here that don't have any idea how a Myanmar government school would be different from a school in a Western country. Yeah. So most Myanmar government schools uh, are, you know, run in, obviously by the military. And um, one thing very just visually very prominent is all students have to wear a uniform, a white top and a green bottom. So you can identify a government student, school student, just by looking at them. We always wear a batch uh, that says which school we're from. Um, and systematically, these schools, uh, um, why you know, there is a difference between each school of which is a better school in terms of which is a top school. And I actually don't know what the criteria is, very arbitrary. It's just that people say, oh, like TTC, for example, is a top government school and most rich kind of wealthier kids or military family kids go there. I went to one of the better ones too, but... Um, yeah, most of these schools just, in terms of education that they provide, it's never critical thinking or expressing your creativity. Part of it is propaganda that we have to learn. The, I think the textbooks are really rigged in favor to, especially history, in favor to the military government and also kind of very nationalistic way, very anti-foreign um, propaganda in there too. And a lot of those, these schools are also somewhat associated with religion. So every morning we would have to come to school. As we're walking into school, they will play like either the national anthem or some propaganda songs and students come in and we stand in an assembly line where you know the shortest kid go into the front and the tallest kids in the back. And if you mess up the order, the teachers will either whip you or really scold you. Um, if you think about it, it's like very militarized thing for children, like young children. Um, yeah. And a lot of the education they provide is just straight up rote memorization. The teacher teaches you a sentence or something that's exactly what you have to write down in an exam no interpretation no freedom to come up with your own solution to a math problem so that's, that's just the basics and in schools every morning we would have to do maybe like 30 minutes of uh, buddhist prayers um, all kids just sing these sermons together while kids from other religions just sat outside. So it never catered to, say, mm -hmm. Muslim students or any Christian students or any students from any other religion. I think that itself first, mm -hmm. not only just create the fight, but kind of given an okay to kids to sort of bully other kids who didn't fit in the Burmese Buddhist mold. So, you know, Mm. Growing up, like being uh, Burmese and Buddhist like me is kind of equivalent to being white and Catholic or Christian in America. Um, right, right. We, we just held more systematic power. and but, but even more so, it sounds like, because yeah. there's not the same separation of church and state that, no. at least by theory and law, we're supposed to have here. It seems like the, the law there was actually written uh, or encouraged to uh, have the religion and nationalism be combined from a young age. Yeah, absolutely. And not only just the law, like it in some ways, just planting that sort of seed into children's mind, just, you know, just thinking about, uh, thinking back of that image of my Christian and Muslim friends 
sitting outside the classroom while all the Buddhist kids mm -hmm. were inside doing an activity together. In a child's mind, it almost felt like, oh, something is something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that divide and sort of discrimination that they created. And not only and because the teachers are doing it, it makes us think that this kind of thing is okay. If you're not Buddhist, sure. something's wrong with you. Is kind of the mentality mm -hmm. I think the, the military government has kind of systematically created to create a uh, divide with, within people. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's Burma is not a not diverse place. If you go downtown Yangon, you see a cathedral, you see a mosque next to it, and in the middle of the town is a Buddhist temple. A block away is a Hindu temple. You see people of different religions and ethnic groups everywhere, yet they're very underrepresented because and everything is so Burmanized. Hmm. In, in right, and not even other Buddhist ethnicities, so even like Shan or Mun or right. Karen uh, mm -hmm. or Rakhine Buddhists, even, mm -hmm. even following a similar religion, the uh, ethnic characterization of that religion can be uh, can be different and can be reinforced and separated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even schools in those states, you know, the official language is Burmese. So if you're a Shan kid um, growing up in Shan State and you know and speaking some sort of dialect or language, you're still forced to speak Burmese. And if you don't, there is almost like absolute no chance for you to climb up the social ladder or go to right. college. So mm -hmm. you know, those kind of things, I think it was very intentional, just part of the whole scheme of how they stay in power. Yeah. Mm. And, and how about your home life? Mm -hmm. So how did you, so this is kind of the environment that you were in school. What mm -hmm. kind of traditional home did you come from in terms of mm -hmm. how Buddhism meditation perhaps was practiced? Yeah, I mean, uh, my both my parents were devout Buddhists. They were more, you know, they were open-minded people, though. So my dad has a lot of Muslim friends and business partners from different religions. So they weren't um, very extreme compared to, you know, some groups of pe mm -hmm. people. But religion and um, practice is still a, still was a very prominent. Thing in my life every morning my mom would wake up or early she would go to her shrine you know which is kept really nice you know, it's a golden buddha statue with flowers mm. and even like before she eats anything she would offer the shrine the food that we're going to have for the day what she would cook that's like the first thing she does same with my dad he would wake up and the first thing you know he does after washing his face or taking a shower is to go in front of the shrine and pray um so same had same was kind of enforced on us but my parents weren't too strict so we were you know asked to do that you know, um, not in a very forceful way but we just did it because oh this is a good thing to do so me and mm -hmm. my sister both would do that and a lot of the travels were mostly religious travels like family right. vacations and whatnot you know in uh -huh. Burmese it's called um, yeah. it's it's kind of almost equivalent to having a vacation for a Buddhist family you know sometimes it's resorts and whatnot but most of the time it's going to a different state to a famous temple uh, and going to a uh, a very specific monastery to go see this famous monk who who is claimed to have some sort of powers or um, you know your wishes come true or something so we would go to a lot of uh, uh, places like the Jaitio pagoda in Mon State yeah. uh, the the golden stone right, golden rock yeah the golden rock uh, that's really popular I think amongst um, Buddhists Fat, like families, I, I've probably been there at least like six, seven times. Um. <laughs> you know, it, it's really funny. It cracks me up because a friend of mine was telling me, a friend who's been in the country for a long time, mm -hmm. remembered when the country started to open up around the 90s or so, and they really had this promotion of tourism, kind right. of limited tourism. And he said how like these early tour tours that started 
all the tour companies, all they did was take foreigners on trips where all they did was see pagodas every day, yeah. all day. <laughs> and they just, because they, they didn't, under, I mean, it was such a devout Buddhist mind state yeah. that even when people were coming from, um, that, that didn't have any interaction with Buddhism, mm-hmm. they couldn't imagine any other travel or trip that could be organi- right. organized around anything except just seeing pagodas all day, every day. Uh, yeah, you know. a- abs- absolutely. I mean, there are, even so, for example, Bagan is very popular amongst the tourists too, but for, I think, a little bit of different reasons than why it's popular amongst, um, you know, the Buddhist Burmese people. Uh, there, I, I, I remember like maybe like when I was in my teens, I would go, I went with my grandma and aunt and then that whole time the tour group arranged it uh, you know, arranged to visit all the different temples, but apparently it, they all, all these temples had to be fit, visited before noon. Only hmm. then like the effect of like whatever wish you made or uh, something comes, right. you know, comes true. Like there's not only kind of Buddhism as perceived by the West or Buddhism as is written on the scriptures. Buddhism and Burma is right. very much intertwined with just your with the culture too, you know, like yeah. with with a lot of uh, super like superstition, because in a lot of houses yeah. you will see not only the Buddhist shrine, but many other uh, shrines that are called nuts. Nut worship yeah. is really huge. I mean, it was a lot of people worshipped nuts before the king Anuradha came in and brought Theravada Buddhism. So, and it's still a prom- prominent thing. So it's, yeah, so it's very interesting. It's just not just like meditation and you know, talking ab- mm-hmm. about trying to achieve nirvana and peace as we kind of perceive maybe in the West about what Buddhism is. Mm. Yeah, a lot of it is just culture and like... Wait. Yeah, that's interesting because it reminds me of how when people in this country in the West are coming to Myanmar, especially for meditation or monasticism, they're often coming from a background of meditation. They've taken a silent meditation retreat or they're interested in Theravada Buddhism. And so, and even today, when I see online a lot of these meditators living in different countries outside of Myanmar, trying to understand the current situation, they're understanding it through a prism largely of their isolated Mm -hmm meditation practice. And that particular part of Buddhist experience, of Burmese Buddhist experience, but not understanding how the greater parts fit into it. And what what was so interesting for me when I first got there, and it took me so long to kind of understand this and realize it, was the sense that, so I'm coming to the country with with a real interest in meditation. I mean, I'm following the five precepts, Mm -hmm. and I have respect for monks and for people who are following this more noble path. And I, I believe in the basic Buddhist doctrine. I'm meditating several hours a day and doing intensive retreats. And so on one hand, I have so much in common with people of the culture and they really right. welcome me into this uh, kind of inner sanctum of you know religious experience and spirituality. And it's this really special kind of bond and connection that we have. But as I start spending longer there, there's like this disconnect I don't really get And over time, I started to realize where this disconnect came from was that partly was that practicing meditation in my own society put me in this kind of like rarefied progressive and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, free thinking um, kind of liberal um, mode of spirituality. And when I was doing that same practice back in Myanmar, that was actually that practice was fitting inside a much more conservative, traditional, Mm -hmm. religious, mainstream function. And so like, Mm -hmm. even though we really shared a lot of the commonalities of how we held the practice and how we even held the goal of the practice and held Mm -hmm. certain doctrines, all those things were similar. Some of those beliefs around it and the traditional aspect in which meditation was operating Mm -hmm. to say nothing about what you said, you know, the superstition, the the animist beliefs, the Mm -hmm. um, kind of just cultural beliefs. I mean, there's certain, you can call them religious cultural beliefs that are much more about Myanmar than they are, uh, and much more about Burmese culture than they are about anything that's in the scriptures. I mean, sometimes there's no scriptural reference at all. It's just a belief that's taken on, this is how you should behave towards monks, or this is how monks should act. And actually, Mm -hmm. there's nothing in the scriptures for that. It's just the way that monks have come to be held in Burmese society. And so Mm -hmm. there's, um, you know, you've done the reverse. You've came from that 
Burmese Buddhist culture into yeah. the West. I've gone the other way, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, and I think when when someone's come from one direction to the other and, and and been in those different societies, it's really interesting to be able to talk about. Uh, how it's held in one place and how it's held in another. I mean, you're in California, so you must come in contact with kind of neo-Buddhist thought in oh, all yeah. kinds of... Absolutely. There's the Spirit mm. Rock Meditation Center just like in... So I live in a county called Marin County. Mm. So it's just to the west, there's a big meditation center, one kind of up north. You know, it, there's a lot of interest in Buddhism because where I am, it's prominently kind of wealthy white fam like families were very mm -hmm. educated um but also have interest in this kind of stuff so you know i've been to a couple of these meditation places and like it's no it's nothing like buddhism so different for yeah. for me you know it's well i mean some some ways it might be a little just whitewashed too and be, 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 maybe that's why because i felt like well, this isn't really what I practice or how I grew up with. Um, yeah, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's just it, the way that Buddhism is perceived and practiced is just so fundamentally mm -hmm. different um, back home than here. You know? Right. And so you were telling me before we started the interview that you mm -hmm. were, uh, so you, you talk, you've talked a little bit about how, Buddhism was practiced in your home, about how mm -hmm. it was practiced in the school. And then in addition to that, you were also sent to these Buddhist summer camps north yeah. of Yangon. So what was that about? So yeah, it was in Ma, like Mabi. It's one of the very prominent monks have, I think he was one of the first monks to sort of popularize that kind of program too. So traditionally summer programs for kids um, are, are usually more a little more rigid and strict. It's just mostly teaching kids how how to speak politely or um, maybe mm. learn a little bit of Bali uh, and some Buddhist scriptures and learn me meditation. Um, so he created this campus uh, built very beautifully. Um, he still the difference is he still let the children play, and we weren't forced to wear um, yogi uniforms which means, right. yeah, like the white and the brown uh, right. uniform is something that you would wear where a lot of people go into these uh, kind of meditation or just religious retreats. You uh, adopt like those practices for however long um, of a period of time that you're in it. But uh, that was one of the rare uh, camps that he has started. But still going into those, you know, it's it's very Buddhist. Um, he he loved children and um, we were allowed to ask questions and whatnot. So that was the main difference that he had. But still, it was strange to me kind of just as a child being sent to, you know, a meditation camp or it's hard to get 13 year old children meditate <laughs> you know, no matter mm. what did you meditate there yeah we we had to it's part of sometimes like up to an hour or two hours like i don't know how children did that but you know somewhat mm. driven by force because it, i think at mm -hmm. least for me and i can speak you know this I can speak for all my other friends who went through the same experience. I mean, part of it, yeah, I learned, I think, good virtues and kind of it shaped uh, me in a positive way. But also some parts of it, it felt like religion was forced upon me. Like I've said before, I didn't perceive myself as a Buddhist because I came to learn more about about it or I came to admire more aspects of Buddhism by myself. It was just something I was born it born with. And it was just at birth you are already inserted an identity that you must have and then you must follow. So those meditation camps and whatnot just reinforce that for me. Um, kind of a line of thinking that oh I'll always be Buddhist Burmese. I never thought of marrying a person from a different race or a different religion. It was, mm -hmm. it used to be almost mm -hmm. a sin, you know, if 
Mm-hmm. I f- and yeah, so that's it's that's kind of a line of thinking in my family too. Although when it eventually happened, they were very open minded about about it. They tried really mm-hmm. hard because they they loved me, but. Um, yeah, in the beginning, there's still a sentiment that it's just not a thing to, I don't know. Yeah, that, that was one question else. I was going to ask. So yeah. you've talked about, yeah, so you've talked about how Buddhism was held in your school, about how it was practiced devoutly in your family, and then how mm-hmm. you would actually go to these extended camps where you would learn virtues and maybe a little doctrine and definitely mm-hmm. some meditation during the day. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious at that at that age, at that time, how you were holding your Buddhist identity. You mentioned just now how you, all these things, all all of these practices did enforce some kind of way of thinking about your identity and kind of solidifying that. But beyond that shape of identity, was it also taking a role in terms of your interactions with the religion, with the teachings, with the, uh, um, the practice of meditation or how was it shaping your understanding of who you were and, and what, uh, the, the purpose of this teaching or practice was? Yeah. I mean, at that time, of course, I never thought about it. I just did it because my parents wanted me to do it. I just did it because, uh, all my friends are going and, you know, besides being a meditation camp, it's fun to be with your friends away from your parents for the summer. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, in in many ways, because the way Buddhism always inserted on, like, you know, just peace and nitta is one word that's very common. I think that you treat right. everyone with kindness, kindness, even your enemies and whatnot. So I think that shaped me in a way throughout my life. Even like now, maybe some of it is healthy, but some of it could be unhealthy too. As in when I feel like I never allow myself to be mad at someone. Oh, right. You know, because I always try to kind of, because that's that's told to be such a virtuous, such a righteous way Mm. to live. You always put yourself in someone's shoes and... Um, even if they're such a bad person, you still treat them with, you know, good, like kayuna is the Bali word, or mita, just, you know, with love and kindness. Mm-hmm. And the the ultimate path, if someone, you just can't get along, you ignore them is kind of, I- ignorance is kind of like another virtue that they have taught us. So it made, it made me some somewhat... I know in my uh, interactions with people here, you know, even with my interaction with my husband, who's born and raised, you know, you know, he's Caucasian um, here, you know, born and raised, kind of atheist sort of way. You know, I feel like in many ways, my interaction with people here just is whenever there's con- like conflict, it, the default is either I try to think me being mad is my fault Mm. um, or being angry is just just not a good thing and if and if you just don't get along with someone a friend or someone who you're working on in a project the tendency is to try to treat them as nicely as you can and in the end if you can't ignore but never kind of confronting and really standing for your around or what do you think <laughs> yeah that, that that's really interesting because it, it, in my experience in being in the country i think i think you're touching upon both what a virtue it is as well as uh when it's on the other side which i, I think i personally think whatever good qualities any person or even kind of a cultural quality is that there's always these two sides of it uh, how it comes out well and then how it kind of goes over to the other side where you have to start looking at how it's coming out for me being in Myanmar I've never been in a country where there's been such a high degree where I felt so much personally Mm -hmm. tolerance and acceptance where I felt so much forbearance where I've screwed up intentionally or unintentionally so many times and have just been responded to with almost unconditional love and almost like never mind never mind and Mm -hmm. so on one hand seeing how that 
was re- relayed to me. And also when I would face a difficult situation and seeing kind of these better angels um, brought to mind mm-hmm. of how something can be dealt with, it, it, it was really quite beautiful and really seeing that, okay, this is a, a whole kind of starting the wheel of um, of frustration or anger and other stuff. Oh, I don't have to do that. I can just, I don't even have to go there. And that, that was something right. that I, I really learned and benefited yeah. greatly from being in mm-hmm. the culture was just how much forbearance mm-hmm. was shown. But then as I started to be there longer, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but I did feel like I started to see another side of that. And that other side was that sometimes there can be an emotion that comes that you can just choose not to give food to. You can just say, I'm not going to go there. That's not, mm-hmm. that's not good. That's not healthy for me. Mm-hmm. I have this wise understanding of the role of karma that I'm going to bring to mind. And and Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to put coals on the fire. It could be very Mm -hmm. powerful, but then there could be other scenarios where you kind of have to have different tools in your toolbox to work with them Mm -hmm. where that anger is already there or that, that deep pain or discomfort is already there. And so the question is the, the way of looking at it, the analogy is not so much putting coals on a fire or not. The analogy would be this fire is burning and I can, I could accept that it's there or not. I could Mm -hmm. either suppress that this fire is in front of me and tell myself this superficial Buddhist wisdom that will allow me to try to pretend it's not there and to to behave the way I want. Mm -hmm. Or I can go deeper into the actual Buddhist wisdom and say, there is suffering, there is defilement. And uh, I am a human who has not been enlightened yet. And so I can admit and process this defilement that's in me. And right now this defilement is I am so angry at this person. I want to slap him in the face Mm -hmm. and I could own that feeling. I don't have to do the thing, but I could own that feeling and explore (laughs) the difficulty and the pain that this anger is upon me. And so sometimes I would see this, this uh, dichotomy between um, a certain um, negative emotion that would start to come and just not giving any food for it. That was just so, inspiring and so wonderful and would teach me so much about how you didn't have to go there. But then other times I would see an emotion or a situ or even just a bad situation that was clearly there Mm -hmm. and a a kind of awkwardness or refusal to want to acknowledge it and want to explore it and thinking that, well, the Buddha taught that we're not supposed to have these emotions or Mm -hmm. we're not supposed, you know, it's better to think in this way. No, that's not what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught that these emotions are there and we have to go into them and explore it. And he gave us tools for being able to do so. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know if that was similar to what, what you were getting at. No, I mean, that's absolutely right. It's just, I think the other, another thing that plays into it is culture. You know, as, you know, I've mentioned, like mentioned before, Buddhism back home is just so intertwined with just being, you know, the Burmese way or whatever. It's kind of, we, like like you were saying, never mind, never mind, yabare is mm-hmm, the... Mm-hmm you know, equi- equivalent of it and, you know, and the other word, anare, that doesn't translate mm, into yeah. a- English, you know, because people just don't want to be someone else's, people are really afraid to be someone else's burden and they mm. always want to help uh, others. And in some ways, you know, I, I find myself when I got here, it's kind of always worrying to sort of, ask help from someone or just learning to say, Hey, I'm not okay. Can you mm. help me? Is mm. sort of, cause you're always anare to it. Someone else. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the things that uh, I definitely kind of faced, kind of transition myself into being a Burmese American. Mm. Um, you know, and what year did you come over here? How, how old were you? Yeah. Uh, 19. Uh, mm. And I'm I am 26 now, so it's been <laughs> yeah, it's been kind of seven eight years, um, and yeah, I mean, still learning. I don't think I'll ever be like Burmese American or Burmese or American. I think mm-hmm. I'll always be. It's you know, when I go home, I don't feel Burmese. When I'm here, I definitely don't feel American. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just yeah, finding that place. But going back to, you know, what you were saying, you know, for how much, um, like, love and kindness just in general, the birth, like, the people in Myanmar have, and how much anger that I've been seeing uh, nowadays just speaks to the depth of what this dictatorship has done to people. You know, it's because for people like my grandma, 
this is the third time it has happened for my, sure. you know, um, for my mom, she, she, mm. she was, you know, she, she faced the 1988 revolution and like 2007 and then now this. So it's, you know, if my grandma is cussing and using <laughs> bad words, you, you know that someone really did something and bad. she is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, cause, and I mean, and then that's one thing that I've been, it's sort of inspiring for me to see is that people, um, and like even older people too, who was raised in a very religious way or now, I think being able to stray away from traditional virtues of what being a Burmese Buddhist mean, and then trying to fight for their freedom. I've never seen more unification between different ethnic groups and religions now. And, mm. you know, as much as many lives has been sacrificed, I think coming out of this on the other side, I think there is a different kind of, I don't know, culture, like almost and a different Burma or a different Myanmar just waiting for us. Because, you know, people, especially with this Rohingya, it, issue that a lot of like Burmese Buddhists, like even my family to kind of denying and, you know, standing on the side of Aung San Suu Kyi was a lot of what people did back home when the, I, you know, uh, when we were charged for genocide. <laughs> um, and now I see a lot of older people or people who stood their side just coming out and saying like, oh, I pledge after this happened, I will be kinder to um, ethnic minorities and, you know, and I'm willing to amend my mistakes. So in a way, I think that has changed a lot of the way people perceive about different religions and different ethnic groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So before we started recording, you were talking about how when you got to America that mm -hmm. you also became interested in therapy and understanding mm -hmm. the role of trauma. And that's really interesting because in the West already, there's quite an intersection between uh, this kind of um, therapeutic work and, and where meditation fits into that. And again, yeah. this is something where you came from at reverse of how many people do it here, where they start mm -hmm. with the therapy and emotions and then they get into meditation. You right. started with Buddhism and meditation and the understanding the role of karma and metta and those other things. And then once coming to the West, you then opened up to exploring um, going to therapy. So I'm curious right. what how that came about and mm -hmm. what intersections you saw with your previous Buddhist training and then being in the West and trying mm -hmm. this um, this practice that's much more common here. Yeah, I mean, therapy came about because, you know, college is stressful and I came here with like a full merit scholarship. So I had a lot of pressure, like not just me, I think this applies to a lot of Burmese students who came to study abroad with scholarships, especially if they're not from a rich, wealthy family. It's just, I just feel an obligation to do something um, for people back home. And that's the, per like, that's the pressure I feel like I constantly just carry on throughout college and sometimes you know it's, i'm like a 20 year old can just carry just so mm -hmm. much college is sometimes just enough sure. stress to yeah. uh, put on you know a person so that's when i started seeing at first it's just to address you know and manage my stress better with college but the more and more kind of i explore it into it i started learning how uh, like me and the way I do things, how much how much of it was actually affected by just growing up in a military dictatorship alone. Because, you know, I, I went to a school on a street where Aung San Suu Kyi's residence was. So during high, high school, there's always armed guards in front of 
per house, and I would mm. have to pass by the building, uh, pass by our house almost every day. And um, you know, just the thought of just consciously or unconsciously, as a child, just seeing armed guards and guns all the time in front of a school, which is a space that a child should feel safe and happy and, you know, just learning about the world. It never, it, it always kind of instilled fear to me. And also because of beatings in schools by the teachers, I mean, it, it doesn't happen. The teachers much, beat the students? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't happen as much anymore. You know, the culture mm. is cha- changing. But, you know, when I was young, just for breaking like a small rule, not even like really breaking a rule. I just asked a teacher a question, you know, about math, like some math pro- like problem. I said, oh, can we not do it this way too? It is short. I was coming up with a better solution to a mm-hmm. problem. But, mm-hmm. you know, it says like, oh, you're so talkative. So she made me kneel in front of the class, in front, you know, in front of the whiteboard and then like whipped my foot. Had to take off my mm. slippers, and and it's, it's just not me. It's a lot of kids uh, went through this sort of experience, and it's very it was very normalized. So fear is you know the primary um, just tactic used by the military, and it's institutionalized. It is embedded in mm-hmm. just educational practices. So that really shaped, I think, me in a way that you know when I came here too, it's just, I do a lot of things with fear, um, mm. fear of losing something because back home, it's, it's true. Like any day at any time you speak about something, you're automatically thrown into prison. You know, I, I had my godparents uh, more like they were neighbors who kind of took care of me too, because that's a prominent thing. They were relative to Aung Suji, so one day they were just snap taken away from me for years in prison for doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. You know, and then it's the same as the protest that's happening now. People just peacefully protesting, and there's no warning, just plain shooting. It's yeah. not a crackdown; it's a killing. So. When you grow up in that kind of environment, I feel like a lot of things I do, I'm so afraid to lose something. There's consciously or unconsciously always fear in the back of my head of, you know, something I say or something I do would put me into danger. Hmm. Like at first, even coming to the United States, kind of the culture of you know having professors and teachers who are extremely very friendly, especially in California too. <laughs> you know, like my some mm. of my professors come to class in flip flops and it's mm. very ca- casual. They give you a donut and you <laughs> go in and complain about your boyfriend. You know, it's a very friendly mm. sort of culture here that's very when you know, asking questions are very encouraged. So at first that was that was a big culture shock to use just I bet. yeah, like talking back to a teacher when you see that they're making a wrong point, correcting them. Um, yeah, so all sorts of things like that. Yeah, so it's it's so interesting. <laughs> it's interesting again because this is where our lives intersect, because mm-hmm. I initially went to Myanmar <laughs> to run teaching and training courses. So mm-hmm. I just as you were coming from that traditional environment. To, uh, to to a place like the West, I was actually kind of bringing that West into a mm-hmm. traditional environment. And I had such as interesting experiences with my students. Uh, and my students were probably in their like, you know, early to mid 20s. So they were mm-hmm. they were mature young adults. Mm-hmm. But such interesting things that I was dealing with that remind me of what you're saying. So like one of those things is that is just the I really wanted to break down the the role and the authority of the teacher and mm-hmm. to help them see their own learning. And so I would do things on the very first day, little tricks to show my my infability, or my um, 
to show like my uh, my lack of complete authority. I would I would mm-hmm. kind of intentionally embarrass myself yeah. to show that I was doing something wrong, and then I would dramatically call attention to the things I did wrong, mm-hmm. and kind of highlight like, oh, so is your teacher not perfect? Like, is this can this really be the case that your mm-hmm. teacher doesn't know everything? And mm-hmm. they would they would start to kind of see this, and then I would play on that to break it down more. One time I would. I would give them a, a group activity to do. And while they were doing it, I would start to move further and further away. Mm-hmm. And then I would yell out, you know, stop. Like, have you been learning this time? And they would say, yeah, yeah, we have. And I would say, well, what was your teacher doing to help you learn? Mm-hmm. And they would all look a little bit uncomfortable because obviously I wasn't doing anything. Yeah. And um, and they wouldn't say anything. I was like, well, where was I standing? And I would, they'd point to where I was standing. I was like, kind of like out the door. And I would say, so do you mean that it's actually possible for you to be learning without your teacher being involved? Yeah. And they would kind of start to slowly <laughs> smile and shake their head yes. Okay. So it was this kind of like, like integrating this knowledge into them that mm-hmm. I wasn't perfect. And as their teacher, I wasn't perfect. And I also mm-hmm. wasn't uh, essential to their learning process, uh, mm-hmm. starting to kind of build them up and give them more confidence that they could learn on their own and see mm-hmm. things on their own. And that would develop further day by day and week by week to when we would we would give each other feedback in the class. Mm-hmm. We would do different different experiences and whatever the training was, we would do them. And then we would all share how we felt. And in the mm-hmm. beginning when I did this, the answers were always things like, well, we we felt like this or we felt like that. And I would have to break down I statements and saying, well, take responsibility for how you feel and expressing that. And that led to these fascinating conversations of how uncomfortable they were to say anything that would make anyone else feel uncomfortable. You know, mm-hmm. to say like, I didn't like this activity because, or I felt awkward because of this. And so we would, mm-hmm. I would have to develop like days of workshops to just investigate why it was okay to, to own your feelings and mm-hmm. to say, you know, right. I felt this way at this moment and that you can phrase this in a way where no one feels uncomfortable. And actually everyone learns and grows by being right. able to hear your experiences and know that, oh, okay, well, this is how this person felt and this is how this felt. And so that gives mm-hmm. me information about what what I was doing, what I was saying, so we could, and, and the harmony actually and the unity actually increases by this mm-hmm. sharing. So, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it was, it's, yeah, it's very, very interesting because in some ways, Burmese people can be really blunt and <laughs> right. kind of, you know, speak, speak their mind in some context. I, you know, not to like blame the dictatorship again, but I do think a lot of, I don't know, people, um, people's behaviors like that really come comes from just being in the military government because you can be thrown into jail for speaking your mind at any time. Right. So right. even if, you know, even if they like, I mean, a lot of Asian cultures tend to be less confrontational and mm. expressing, you know, really what you feel. Yeah, maybe there's some truth to that, but I think there's another layer added onto it as in consciously or unconsciously, like I was, you know, experiencing with myself. I'm always fearful because just my experience just seeing guns in front of my school or just seeing soldiers everywhere um, in a school place, just thinking about my teachers who whip us for just absolutely, you know, almost no reason. Um, so that fear kind of, you know, follows me. And sometimes, you know, it's because it's 19 years of my life living through that. Mm-hmm. So it's crawling everywhere, even when I'm now in a safe space. Mm-hmm. You know, so some, sometimes that comes up and I feel like, yeah, that's one of the biggest impact I think it has had on me. So imagine if someone is living in that country and for generations and you know ne- ne- never had the chance to dissect how much this military has oppressed right. people's thoughts and their ways mm-hmm. of ex- expression so i think the culture that kind of culture where people don't really express their emotions freely i think comes from you know truly comes from just fear because of the dictatorship 
Right. And it might not just be that people aren't expressing their emotions. Mm -hmm. It might also be that internally they're not themselves in touch with those depth of emotions. And so when you started therapy, did Mm -hmm. that put you more in touch with emotions that you didn't know you had? And how did that go? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting thing. You know, um, it's not only just fear. There's a lot of things I had to unpack. It's kind of the role of woman, um, kind of the role of being an oldest daughter in a family or just being like, you know, oldest child where you expect to really take care of your family after you have, you know, attained success and kind of inherent selflessness that I should have because I am an oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, unpacking all of that was a, a difficult thing because I sometimes feel that if I were just there and I never came here or n- never talked to therapy. In some ways, I would have been fine because this is a virtue that's taught to me. I'm okay with it. A lot of my aunties mm-hmm. did it. My mom mm-hmm. did it. She's okay. She's you know happy. There's a, you know some some things that of course uh, she needs to unpack and get in touch with herself. But I feel like it's sort of having a taste of what it is like to be a woman in a different society sort of make me angry and depressed about all the times I have oppressed. No, no, sorry. All all the times I was oppressed Mm -hmm. and also oppressed myself and also Mm -hmm. stopped myself from speaking my mind, um, stopped myself from doing something because I was a woman, you know, I think all that like anger really only opened up when I came to therapy and when I came here. Wow. Yeah, especially you know, it's like it's a little more different in California too. Especially I went to like a small liberal arts college mm. and, and kind of uh, there's some hippy dippy professors. <laughs> and, mm. You know, it's just it's just the way of thinking about women's role is. Not, not to say America is perfect either. There are so many issues we're still working on. But yeah, it's just everything just only poured out when I came here. Sort of, you know, put me into a, a depressed, angry state. <laughs> and did therapy help you work through those emotions? Yeah, I mean, mostly through just uh, talking and just cognitive exercise, a lot of a lot of writing, a lot of art. Um, just to express and unleash this anger that I have in a healthy way and also somewhat to it like a, a productive way so I can help, you know, my friends, I, I can help create a safe space for someone else who's going through the same experiences that I did. Right. So you talk about the value of this therapy and dealing with these difficult emotions and letting them out in a productive way. And you've also talked about in your your Buddhist background in Myanmar and growing up and the influence you, you saw that you, you still hold this kind of metta and compassion and goodwill in a special place. And so where do these different belief systems come together? Like, I'm sure you haven't abandoned everything mm-hmm. about the way that the values that were instilled with you. And then you, you mentioned that you learned some good things at summer camp. So yeah. where, where do the good values of your traditional Burmese Buddhist education and mm-hmm. family life come and your, the, the therapy that you're going through now and that you're gaining here in the West, how do you integrate those together? Yeah, it's a very interesting thing because I mean, when I first came here, when I first got into college, because I was taking a lot of other religion classes too, you know, and it's, uh, and it's a great time to sort of explore and take off the skin that I've been wearing, you know, for 19 years and go explore other like ways of thinking and sort of trying to craft my own um, belief system or practice. I mean, practice hasn't really been a, a thing in the past, you know, f- few like few years it's not that like I abandoned my religion I still identify as a Buddhist actually but uh you know I don't do a lot of the traditional things that Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up doing and I do intend to explore what form or sort 
you know, of being a Buddhist that feels truly me while mm-hmm. not trying to appropriate my culture, my own culture and my own religion in a very, I don't know, Western condescending way. Oh, I'm only taking the good parts that I like and going to make it my own sort of way. Mm-hmm. So I'm still coming into place with that. Mm-hmm. But in terms of just, I think because I was a Buddhist, I think I was able to be very compassionate and very empathetic towards um, a lot of people here, you know, you know, because to a degree, really treating them with uh kind of not only helped my own inner peace, but also allowed me a platform to really understand where a person comes from and why, you know, why they are the way they are. Because after realizing, like, the way I talk, the way I think, just the way I act, how much of it has actually come from my religious background as well as my, you know, traumatic uh, military dictatorship background. I, to me, you know, everybody on earth went through something like that. And like, so sometimes even if they're sort of a bad person or somebody who doesn't get along with me, I think because of my Buddhist background, I'm able to kind of go into their shoes and really think, you know, why mm. why are they like this and not get angry at them and not feel righteous about, oh, you're wrong and, you know, I'm right. Like, even when I'm encount- encountering, like, I don't know, a Trump support or um, someone, you know, who have very different beliefs than I am. Um, you know, I will, and also I will allow myself to be angry when I need to be angry when someone's saying some racist, sexist stuff. I'm not gonna mm. sit there and oh, I'm trying, mm, I'm gonna right. try to understand where you come from. Right. At, at those moments, I'm gonna step up and say what you're saying is really messed up and you're a terrible person. So I think both these things have kind of gave me a space to, sorry, uh, gave me an opportunity to go to that place where I, when I'm angry at someone, I'm allowing that to happen. I'm allowing my language to change and the way, mm, I'm not, right. not going to just emit that all the time to people who say terrible things like this. I'm not going to emit that to the military government who staged a coup in 2021. And so it's kind of a balance between, yeah, let myself be angry, let myself feel anything that I'm feeling, but also in certain cases, just trying to be compassionate. Yeah. Right. And so you've been doing all this therapy work in the West and also integrating this Burmese Buddhist practice of metta into it as you, as you, as you do, as you live there and, and integrating this into your being and into your life. And then February, 2021 happens. And, <laughs> Was this uh, did, was this a trigger? Did this did this bring the the trauma back in in new and painful ways? Yeah, I mean, I think this is true to a lot of um, you know Burmese citizens too. We're just recovering. It's only really been five years that the country has some form of economic liberation, a tiny form of maybe equality. You know, just. Now, only now kind of small family-owned businesses are having access to things like digital marketing and online shopping. And the country's only boom, like booming. Um, and people are healing through that process. And bam, this happened. You know, uh, it definitely triggered a lot of first fear in me, the fear that a lot of my friends, including my family, a lot of the children who were just growing up would have to go through the same exact thing that I have to go through. Because it really, you know, like I said, it really impacts your whole life. It's like a shadow that's in you and you have to do a lot of work to undo all that internalized oppression in yourself. And I just really don't want another child to grow up with that kind of fear. Um, 
So when this happened, of course, all the anger unleashed, you know, it's just the most violent thoughts I can have. And also I'm allowing myself to have them and expressing that in, you know, more productive ways. Like I've been writing poetry, I've been doing art to unleash all of that. So there is a shared common ground for people who are feeling that way and can't, don't know how to express it or un unleash it and people are dealing with their own ways. But um, I think sometimes having a shared a a anger <laughs> really makes me feel better to, you know, just talking about it to a friend or having people look at my art and people messaging like, yeah, I that's exactly how I feel. I'm like, yes. Um, yeah, so it did trigger like a lot of fear. I know I since it started, I haven't been able to sleep really well, honestly. Even right. with like a melatonin or whatever. And I would wake up periodically at night just checking my phone constantly. Yeah. Because yeah. any time, you know, I could lose a friend or yeah. a family. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so it's that itself is just, and it's not like <sighs> I can say, oh, like today I'm going to do a social media cleanse and shut off my phone. Like, right. I feel like, I feel like that's, although, you know, I'm also dealing with a lot of turmoil, I feel like that's for me <laughs> such a privileged position to take. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> that's a privileged position to be able to do this. You know, yeah. maybe you like me, every single person I know is out. Yeah. I don't know a single person who's inside. Yeah. And and I see pictures of them. And these are the dearest people in my life. And yeah. these are the a lot of these people are extremely apolitical. They're not they're they're they they've they're they're some of the, the dearest people I know are are Buddhist practitioners who mm -hmm. live for nothing more than to do their own practice, to do good deeds and to help others who are on the path. There's nothing really more that defines them. And these are people sitting on the side of a road with a sign asking for their freedoms. Yeah. And I, I'm terrified for them. I'm terrified for all of them. Yeah. And some friends of mine got tear gassed the other day. You know, my neighborhood was just raided yesterday and some people got arrested. You know, so it's just things like that happening. And I feel, I feel like you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it, it's having a lot of impact on me in a way that I'm in constant anger and mm -hmm. kind of worry, fear, you know, just checking in with family all the time, checking my phone all the time. Sometimes you know, it's just, it's just hard to read news that 54 people have died today. Yeah. Um, not like that. They were killed, you know, and kind of just go back to, I don't know, doing my, job or just yeah. everything else just feels uh, in a way so pointless because if this were to happen again most likely that you know because last time it lasted decades so who knows what as much as I'm hopeful there's a side of me that's very fearful that this will last many years again I may never get to see my mom and my sister again I may never get to see my best friends again. I may never get to drink that cup of jazzy again at a roadside tea shop. You know, I may never get to see my grandma again. So it's just all those, per not only just personal thoughts of, oh, my family, my friend, just also just the thought of like a lot of millions of people who have to go under this fear and oppression again, just, yeah, it just makes me angry every single day. And worse yet, this happened right. This happened in the middle of a pandemic. That's that's still there, and COVID right. ain't going away. Yeah, you know, because it was such a hopeful news to hear when right before this happened, Burma has secured a lot of vaccines. Um, one of the first countries in yeah, Asia yeah. to do it for you know how not wealthy the country is, and um. Yeah. You know, just an, just one example. So my sister, she finished college uh, right before the, the, all the COVID thing happened. She got into a master's program there. She started a new job as a teacher. You know, just such a uh, a bright future ahead of her. 
So her master's program got delayed because of COVID. And it was about to, to start back this February because COVID winded down there. And the coup happened and just how crushing it must feel for young youth like her. And then now it's just so heartbreaking to see like every youth I know, all my friends, all my sister friends, all that Generation Z um, age, they, they're saying, if I die, I die. You know, and they're going yeah. out every day knowing they're going to get shot at any time. It's not just like, oh, I could get arrested or it could be a lawsuit. Yeah. Just they know they could die and they're still going out. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah so it's just, it just breaks my heart. And also, like, you know, some sort of survivor's guilt to feel guilty that sure. I'm sitting here, you know, in my office in beautiful California. Um, I'm doing what I can, but I'm not. I'm not there. I wish I was fighting. Yeah, I wish I was there to protect all these lives that died. I wish I was the one who died and not the innocent nineteen-year-old girl. I don't know. So it's just, yeah, all those feelings is so hard to process every day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think when you mention that the attitude you're hearing from people is if I die, I die. And no, they're knowing what they're going into. And I think that this taps directly into this role of trauma that you're talking about, mm -hmm. that I think that that trauma maybe has been suppressed internally. It's definitely not been talked about externally and especially not to foreigners. And so mm -hmm. I think this is a really important area for those of us that really care about what's happening now and are not from the country is taking this opportunity to learn from you in speaking for yourself and for others who are from there mm -hmm. and understanding maybe for the first time or maybe at a depth, at this kind of depth for the first time, just how intense this trauma is. And I think that I was talking about this on a recent podcast that uh, that just got released a couple days ago, at least from when we're talking now. And I framed a question to the young activist in terms of sacrifice. He's, he's mm -hmm. a new, he just got married and found out he was a father last month and he has a great mm -hmm. job in Yangon and he's now on the front lines. And I framed a question in terms of how, how were you able to make a decision to make this sacrifice? And his answer was really hinting at this idea that, that there is no sacrifice. A sacrifice involves the concept that you have a choice, that you can do this or do that. And he laid out this scenario of what had happened before to him and to his family and what would happen in the future to him and his wife and his unborn child. And that this was simply not a future that one could live under by any means. Right. And so as bad as the current situation is, it's not a sacrifice to go out and do what you're doing because a sacrifice infers that you have some choice of something yeah. that you're giving up to get something else. And there's nothing that there's, there's, there's no choice as he sees it. So I think that, and I think that this also goes into some of the misanalysis that Western people might bring to it because when they look at the strength of the protest movement and what protest movements can do in general, I think if you miss this depth of trauma and pain and fear of how things were, mm -hmm. you also miss the enthusiasm and the backs against the wall kind of mentality for doing any means necessary, at least up till now, any nonviolent means necessary mm -hmm. to be able to move forward and to not go back to that, even if moving forward is putting every single person we know in imminent danger at any moment. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely right. You know, because some people are saying, I know a lot of kind of the Western experts who's been, you know, speaking on this. And it's true. I think that's something that they don't see or have an embodied knowledge mm. about. You know, you can only do so much reading and research about it, but right. not ha like laugh the complete you know, and embodied awareness and knowledge about this is that, oh, COVID, what happened to COVID? Like people don't care about it. You know, it's, <laughs> people don't care about getting paid right now. People don't, because anything of that is worse than, right. you know, 
it's it's not I'm sorry it's not as bad as like living under the military because if yes COVID happens and they were under the military because Burma relatively handled COVID pretty well, um, you know they and just imagining if COVID were to happen under this military, how many lives we would have already lost to COVID or just in general, just lives that we're losing every single day in a lot of these civil war zones and a lot of the other states that aren't maybe as talked about in the, because the military has been killing and killing even with the civilian government in the front because they still hold a huge part of 25% of seats in the parliament. And sadly, like weapon just hold a lot of power over people and they've been utilizing that to just kill and stay in power. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough situation. Uh, so I'm trying to stay very hopeful. <laughs> right. And I, I can see, you know, it's interesting because when you talk about your, your feelings that you're processing this month of, the the fear and the terror and the anger on one hand and on the other the sense of optimism and hope in generation z we haven't yet talked about your artwork but yeah. what i've seen of your artwork you're reflecting those two sides you know you have an artwork that i should say has been one of the artworks that's been very widely shared across all yeah. social media i've seen whether you're credited or not it's an artwork of um three fingers being held yeah. up with uh, i think flowers between yeah. the fingers and a red background Right. obviously expressing some hope and optimism. And then I've, yeah. I've seen other drawings you've done that, that, um, that show the anger towards the generals and unleash yeah. these, these other kinds of feelings. So can you say yeah. more about what you're, what you're doing with your art these days? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, that's, I've never really thought of it that way. I think the art I'm making is just how I'm feeling at the moment. Um, Cause yeah, I, I'm, I am living with that duality too. Some days I feel very hopeful. Some days I feel hopeless because if you've seen a lot of the images that is coming up on social media about you know, even people who have nothing like street vendors giving out free food as much yeah. as they can, all these yeah. houses opening up to hide the protesters. Yep, that's people, meta. Yeah, like people feeding each other uh, mutual aid, I've never seen mm. that strong of a mutual aid in a protest. It doesn't happen mm. in the United States. You know, if you look at all the Black Lives Matters uh, protests, these kind of aid just does not exist here. Right, right. Because, you know, all the medical, like, workers just taking supplies from their hospitals, although they're yeah. not going to work, and just seeing patients at home. It's just seeing things like that make is what my hopeful art comes, you know, from. And also seeing some of my friends saying, like, not, you know, not because they're given up, because it's it's been a month. It's been 30 days, and 50, 60 people have died and thousands injured for having a civil protest. So you know, and some part of me feels like there's no point in peacefully pr like protesting these monsters because they don't have, besides being Buddhist, they don't have that empathy or mitta in, in themselves. I truly believe that they're rotten to the core and there's no human left in them. And the military made sure that they systematically brainwash these sol soldiers. Just think about the education system that I have mention it to you and think about how strong that education system would be to the people who are in the military mm, yeah. and, and, and people who only live in that bubble and never came out or went abroad to explore other ideas. So, you know, it, it's, it's scary things that they show about North Korea and I, you know, in situation in Burma and, how the military dictatorship has ruled is as scary as that. Yeah. Or like maybe more. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah so part of you know the healthy way and the productive way I've been trying to do and cope with it is just to put it into my art I'm working on a, a children's storybook in the hopes that maybe one day if I ever raise a child to read it back to them about the revolution um, I'm doing the illustrations but uh, the text part is done, but I don't have an ending because it's because of that fear that I was talking to you and that duality that I live with mm. every day. Some mm. days, you know, I want to write the ending and the spring was saved. <laughs> um, and some days I want to, you know, write the, the evil prevailed. I don't know. Mm. You know, sometimes my husband says, you, you should just write that like we won just you know just to set the tone but you know i i i have to i feel like be honest with myself yeah. and as much yeah. as i'm hopeful about this there's a big part of fear in me um that even if we won there are still so many lives that were taken you know yeah. so many people who are injured who are going to be disabled for the rest of their lives and not only just physical trauma but yeah this is going to carry a lot of emotional and mental trauma f- for the people for the rest of their lives. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so hard to um, stay completely <laughs> hopeful. Yeah, the mental duress that people are under now, mm-hmm. I, I, there's, there's just no way to characterize it. Uh, yeah. the, the, what, what they're under in terms of the, the danger, the, they're, they're not safe during the days, they're not safe during mm-hmm. the nights, they're not safe on the streets, they're not safe in their homes. The, that complete lack of instability and the feeling of being on your own, and you're right, I, you mentioned how you haven't seen this at protests in this country. I haven't seen or heard about this in protests anywhere in my life. Mm-hmm. I, I can't believe the kind of things I hear and see of, uh, of normal residents banding together to use whatever resources and knowledge they have, which is often quite limited given yeah. uh, the, the, the background of the country to, um, to do what they can. And, you know, being so familiar with the country, there's just little details that stand out to me that, mm-hmm. that, really tell a lot. So like, well, one of those details, you mentioned all the people that are playing a part in the protest to help out with this part or this part. Mm -hmm. You know, we interviewed a guy on our podcast who Mm -hmm. has taken over the role of organizing garbage pickup. That's just what he does. He just, he, he and his wife just go out and they, they post pictures of themselves carrying, you know, Mm -hmm. piling, you know, 50 bat, 50 huge bags of garbage. And so the protest sites are left cleaner than when they start. This is, this is not really the the sexiest job to do when you're out in the protest, but (laughs) it's, it's what they do. They do their part. And there was, um, you know, there's another picture that stood out where there was, uh, a few days ago, the police were bringing in um, criminals that they were, you know, injecting with morphine and, and giving weapons, mm-hmm. giving knives yeah. and swords and scissors to, and they were going into the crowds and just randomly stabbing people. And they had showed, uh, there was one one of these criminals who was being detained and they showed him, it, it was like some string or rope or something mm-hmm. that was tied around his feet and his arms that was then connected to the gate on someone's house. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just looking at this thinking, like, these are normal residents that have to figure out how to stop and detain a violent criminal without harming him because they're not trying to harm these people. They sometimes know that these people are victims as much as themselves. It's almost like Roman rulers that are pitting these these unfortunate people against each other and they don't really care what the outcome is. But these... They're 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 trying. Despite all their anger, they're trying to detain them peacefully, but protect themselves. And they're just. I mean, they have to figure out how to tie them, what to tie them to. Could you imagine right. in our communities or any community <laughs> in the world if it was just like, okay, yeah. just look around your house, find someone who knows how to tie a knot, or find someone who knows this skill yeah. or that skill. And this is a professionally <laughs> trained military that you're up against, and you're building barricades, and yeah. it's it's insane. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just it's just ordinary people with you know, ordinary jobs, like not, it's not, you're right. It's just very limited Mm. resources they have. And yet, you know, sometimes I'll see a lot of these uh, criminals who go in there to, you know, create turmoil and the neighborhood security groups catches them and still like feeds them and give them food. It's just, 
Right, right. And that's also, meta. Yeah, that also tells just so much about, you know, the Myanmar people and yes. in a way that, you know, it's that kind of, you know. And I feel like I would do the same too, even when I'm angry. Mm. You know, it's a really a tactic, I think, that's being done by the military to just put the poor against the poor. Uh, mm-hmm. to create divide you know that's what they've been trying to do divide and conquer that's why they're so against mm. you know that these making sure that the discrimination just stays between all the ethnic groups because you know each ethnic groups mm-hmm. have their own resources and power to be able to i think um, go against the military not in terms of like armed forces of course but i think yeah so it's just a yeah, so it's some heartwarming things to just to see through this whole thing. Yeah, it's heartwarming, but it's also it's also heartbreaking. When, yeah, it is. You know, you you see. Uh, sometimes I'm in touch with friends in real time, like mm-hmm. as they're as they're talking about the military convoys they're expecting, and they're building their barricades, and they're yeah. coordinating with each other, and and it's and and they're not these are not people doing anything wrong. I mean, these are yeah. these are not people doing any kind of political organizing or. Uh, they're they're just trying to live, and they're just afraid of this uh, of these troops indiscriminately yeah. coming into their area and just trying to protect each other. It's like one of right. those old Western movies where you know the the bandits are coming from uh, they're three days away and they're on their yeah. horseback, and the small town has to band together and somehow find a way how to outwit these terrifying bandits who are having their their way with the country and. You know, these, these these normal residents that don't have a lot to begin with and are pitted against a professionally trained military. Mm-hmm. It's Yeah. And yeah, I mean think about too is, you know, people have not been working for a month. Most mm-hmm. people, you know, they're fine like financially also uh, you know, probably struggling because we're just coming out of COVID. A lot of places mm-hmm. and businesses were shut down and yet you know I, yeah it's it's heartbreaking to see a, a lot of moms are now gonna have to give birth in the middle of this or mm. yeah it, it's just using anything they can to just protect their lives and the, you know each other too yeah and you know i saw some women sharing like oh take a birth control or have a plan B with you when you go out to protest because if the soldiers catches you, they're going to rape you so you don't yeah. have any unplanned pregnancy. Just, just the fact that women has to talk or have yeah. to talk about that, it's just, you know, it's just, it just riles up just so much anger in, in me for how evil and just, just inhumane and, these soldiers are, I guess. And yet they're still going out. And yet yeah. despite all that, they're still going out because there is no alternative. Right. And yeah. that's I, and I think you don't understand that unless you know this trauma. Yeah. I think unless this trauma is talked about and people, and, and not just talked about, but people who care about the situation mm-hmm. and outside listen to it. They listen to this trauma and they start to understand the, the depth and the pain of this and that there is no going back. This is not a question of a more open or more closed society. Yeah. This is the question of some decent way of life forward and absolute darkness, the likes of which people who are from free societies can't begin to understand. Yeah. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and, you know, again, that's something I've been trying to talk to to you know my friends and family here you know, people and how's that not, going um it's going fine everyone has been really supportive but you know uh this is why our conversation right now is very important for people to hear right it's what they don't understand truly is the trauma because right. sometimes you know all, people are saying oh like you know can you just stay home what about covid you know aren't there more like tactical tactical ways right, to, right you know you know are there like more smarter ways to approach this and yeah i mean there are a, a lot of people are taking that approach to you know trying to be smart trying to be resourceful and trying to be very calculated but you also have to understand is that for a lot of people if they don't do it now it's it's never you know it's 
there's never a time like every almost everybody at least I know like even my mom says like yeah like I don't care if I die if I have to go to prison you know that's all better than just having to live under the that's when people when people are talking about different tactics that it might be coming with good intentions, but that's coming from a privileged mind state. It's coming yeah. from a privileged situation where you think that there are other opportunities, where you think that there right. is another way to go about it. Yeah. And as bad as it is to be worrying about, you know, rape and sniper fire and everything else as an ordinary resident, you, you and and, I, and that, let me be open, this is a process I've gone through in the last couple of weeks. As much as I mm. have known about Burmese history, as much as I've listened to my Burmese friends, I haven't understood, excuse me, I haven't understood the the role that that depth of trauma has played in the decision making that's going forward, that there really is no other option. Yeah. And that's, I think that's something we do all have to understand. Yeah. Uh, and I do want to ask you, so you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're making art and mm-hmm. that's, you, you've been an artist, so it's something natural for you and how you're expressing yourself and also contributing to the the movement because you're, your art is being widely shared and Mm -hmm. seen and probably inspiring to many people. Can you say a little something about what you've seen about what is going on with art in Myanmar and how it's being shared, how it's being made and what is its role at this time? Yeah. I mean, uh, cause the, with even within the protests, there are many creative ways that people are, uh, coming up, you know, uh, with to speak against this injustice and I have a lot of I've seen a lot of like my friends who are doing very creative projects like projections at night right because when you spray paint uh the next day they come all over and paint it and maybe the people yep. paint over it again yep. you know, it's <laughs> yep. a yep. constant battle but like yep. you know, projections things like projections so they can't come and take take it down a lot of like musicians artists are speaking up about it and the way kind of social media plays in sharing that art widely has been a very effective too i think because because back in 1988 you know a lot of artists were doing what i was doing but they didn't have instagram you know, mm, uh, especially right. like artists and poets and all the writers who are living abroad like back then it mm. was so so hard for us to feel like we can contribute something uh, to the movement um yeah because there's i uh, you know there's a facebook uh, group called art for freedom and a lot of uh, mostly graphic artists has been uh, making uh, both for uh, uh, sorry graphic artists who are both in the country or abroad like i am are making a lot of kind of protest signs and posters and stickers and you know um yeah so in some way it's it's been very inspiring and also kind of to see a different to see like anger and frustration and kind of the fight mentality being expressed in a different form because like you were saying you know people some people are out on the streets some people are picking up garbage some people are cooking for a thousand people mm-hmm. and you know and some people are making art and yeah and i think the role it plays is just like i was saying it's just a shared anger shared sadness shared hopefulness that can inspire people in many ways because you know people express things differently but when it, there's something visual for example that painting i made of the military general you know it it's i dream of it like because i, I just can you dream. describe it for people who haven't seen it <laughs> yeah so it's a, it's a um a painting of a especially man line the general you know who is behind all of this leader of all of this him dress in like his full uniform with all the uh, medallions that he's given himself uh, all the stars on his shoulder that indicates the level of his uh, position in the military and it's just him being um, pulled apart and punched by all uh, different kinds of hands, each representing a group of people or kind of 
each, each representing a symbol of people that partakes that, that are partaking in the movement. So for example, monks. So I had a picture of just praying beats on one of the hands that represents the monks, you know, who typically are told to just stay away from typical human anger and human things. Kilita is the word for it. Monks are not to meddle with or, like, you know, or, ordinary people's life, but they don't care hmm. about meditation now <laughs> because uh, they're fighting the fight. And this has happened in 2007 too, you know, like monks who were supposed to stay peacefully came out to, to protest and um, also representing spring uh, with those gungo flowers on the hand, also representing like pots and pans that people have been banking, also kind of represents the group of moms in you, you usually like the role of women, you know, who have been kind of staying inside and cooking for their families are not all out fighting with the rest uh, of the people. Also, I think there was a, like one hand of just from a student un uniform that's stained with blood. Now, this has happened in, back in 1988, the student-led revolution where a lot of students were killed. Um, and this history has started, you know, almost repeating itself. Yeah, so, and then I also portrayed, like, the general as having some sort of, like, a monstrous, evil um, look. And all these hands kind of just trying to rip apart, because that's what I want to do. <laughs> like, you know, that's that's what I dream of doing, is just claw his eyes. I'm sorry if I'm getting violent here, but, you know, that's... That's what well, people, art gives you a space to express that. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I truly feel. And that's what a lot of people were feeling. I also wrote a poem that's associated to that painting. Unfortunately, I can't really translate it to English because the context is very different. But, you know, um, it's just great for me to hear people messaging me and just saying, mm. you know, I, that's just exactly how I'm mm. feeling. You know, I really like your poem. Mm. Um and yeah, that's that's just uh, one way that you know I've been not only just personally just to deal with my anger, um, but also to I think it, it, in a hope that it can sort of alleviate people's angers and emotion that they're feeling um, just by looking at art. Yeah. Yeah, art can be very powerful. And uh, and I'm also curious where you see Buddhism fitting in to this mm -hmm. current protest movement and mm -hmm. especially your generation. Because uh, from my side, I see on one hand, there are Buddhist concepts being part and parcel of the protest movement every day, every action. If you don't yeah. know a lot about Buddhism, you might miss them. But all the time I'm seeing actions that are showing dana, generosity, metta, mm -hmm. loving kindness, karma, understanding the law of cause and effect, and mm -hmm. uh, shila, um, tila, yeah. as you say in yeah. Burmese, yeah. Uh, the following the precepts, um, nonviolence, of course, and on and on. And in small ways and big, I see like uh, Buddhist doctrine, mm -hmm. meditative wisdom born from a lifetime of cultivation, inclining one's mind towards these qualities being played out and it's really beautiful and inspiring myself coming from a background of yeah. this practice and knowing people engaged on the other hand this is a new generation and this is a generation that has is very connected online that has had several years almost a decade of openness and engagement with the mm -hmm. world and with ideas and with people uh with uh, travel in and out of the country and different op employment opportunities and etc right. and so the way this generation is holding buddhism even even as these concepts are at play in the protest but the way they're holding certain traditional aspects of buddhism mm -hmm. might be different somewhat especially in terms of the unity they're trying to create uh, among people that they've been told to have enmity for. So I'm curious for you, how are you seeing Buddhism play out in this current moment? Yeah, um, you know, again, it's interesting because religion is almost an identity that a lot of Burmese people, you know, in my generation or generation before mine holds. But because, you know, like you've mentioned, uh, there's the internet 
which sort of came late to the country. Actually, oh, yeah. Compared oh, to very the, late. Uh, you know, I, I think I went, to, I first got to use internet when I was like 16 at an internet cafe. So, mm -hmm. you know, even for me, it was pretty yeah. late. But all this generation who grew up with technology that kind of allowed them more access to just the rest of the world and then knowing that being a strict Buddhist, like how we were raised to, is just not the only way. So religion is not something like they fear of. You know, they, um, like you were saying, there's dana, there's tila, but uh, they are willing to break it when it comes to injustice. Because I have a lot of, you know, people and young uh, people saying just, I'll kill if I have to. You know, they they're not afraid of going to hell. And I don't know if Buddha existed now or if karma will ever send to hell. I don't think they will be sent to hell for killing mm. a, a ruthless soldier. And so that's one mentality. And you know, again, I think a lot of people my age are coming into this balanced place with you know how I've mentioned before when I'm angry at injustice. I'm going to allow myself to be angry and speak up about it and take action. But when I have to treat someone with kindness, I'm also going to treat them with kindness. So, you know, these young people are giving like up their salaries, giving up their apartments, you know, mm. to, uh, to help other people. Um, you know, even like I was saying, the cr criminals that uh, neighborhood people have caught, they're still treating them kindly right but when it comes to pro like protecting your friends and your family the um a lot of people are just willing to fight or break the rule of don't steal someone's property you know if they see it done and <laughs> from the military yeah i'll steal it to hurt them i'll steal it to protect my people i will you know kill their lives to protect my people um, so yeah, it's it's very interesting and in, in, in a way that you know, like I was saying, a lot of Burmese people who usually are always anai about something, mm. you know, it's called the cult. The culture is almost you know sort of shifting. And, you know, yeah, they're, it is, they're isn't take, it? Take, they're like they're okay to receive help when they mm -hmm. need it, and also you know, I mean. The willingness to give is already there. It's just, mm -hmm. I think selflessness in general is such a virtue that we've been taught that, you know, um, just no worry that it wasn't going to be there. It's, it's very prominent, even more so now. And But also, you know, like I was saying, it's just Thila is sort of being seen in a different way by a lot of, not, not just the younger generation too, even very devout Buddhists like, my mom, you know, who mm -hmm. would never dare harm a soul, mm -hmm. are saying like, "Yeah, let 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 there be blood." You know, if, really, but it's been nonviolent so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely not nonviolent so far. But I think the there's a breaking point. Of course, yeah, there is a breaking point because it's been a month, and the anger and frustration people mm -hmm. are hold, holding not only just started from Feb, like February first. It's, it's, you know, years of growing up in that too. Mm -hmm. It's really only been five years mm -hmm. that we weren't under the military dictatorship on the surface right. level too. You know, it's not, it's not democracy, air quotes, <laughs> um, fully that we've been given to. So, yeah, I think uh, it's victory or death, you know, for a lot of people and yeah, they're still being Burmese by being kind, but when it comes to it, I think a lot of people are willing to take a weapon and fight back. I see. Yeah, well, we can only see how that goes. It's definitely, yeah. these are heavy things to hold. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that I'm thinking, uh, that I've been thinking for the last week, and I'd really, I'd really be curious about your take on it, because mm -hmm. we're talking about like suppression of difficult emotions, or kind of using Buddhist concepts in such a way where mm -hmm. you, if there, if there's very difficult feelings that you don't really want to acknowledge, or 
or even feel being able to suppress them in some way. So you don't have just in normal Burmese society, just so and it kind of goes into an abade as well and into mm-hmm. um, understanding, I would, I would argue, misunderstanding the Buddhist teachings so that you, you're not dealing with something that's actually present. You're not working your way through, through something that is in you and trying to understand it and suppressing it in some way. But it seems like right now the lid has come off. And it <laughs> yeah. seems, and I, I'm curious what you think about that in terms of this age-old traditional Burmese Buddhist experience of both anabade as well as this way of incorporating the Buddhist teachings into just not dealing with some of this pain and trauma and suffering. And it seems like there really is this extraordinary free expression of simple acknowledgement of pain, just and, and on a personal level with friends I know, and on a mass level in terms of what I'm seeing online, mm-hmm. just an ability to express how I've never seen expressed before the basic truth. And actually, I didn't realize this until I said it, mm-hmm. the basic truth, the four noble truths, of course, you know, yeah. the essential <laughs> truth of the Buddha, that there is suffering. That is the first noble truth. And right. I'm actually hearing P- Buddhist friends and people online express different versions of the form, I am suffering, just a basic acknowledgement. And so it feels like there, there's some kind of top coming off of being able to express things that haven't been before. But I also understand I'm an outsider and there's probably dynamics I don't understand. You're someone who's worked through this so intrinsically at going from out of one culture into another. What are you seeing here? Yeah, I think I think that's a very, uh, almost a very accurate assessment of it. It's true because, you know, like I was saying, if my grandma is using cuss words, <laughs> um, if she is willing to, you know, <laughs> with whatever she can if I feel like if someone were to come take her one of her children away she would grab her I don't know what puts that thing called thing uh, like I don't know her mortar <laughs> mm, mm, right some <laughs> like, kitchen tool uh, yeah some kitchen tool to like fight against these people you know and um yeah and again you know it's not I think people are kind of more not like in tune with their um, emotions. There's a, a lot of to process, uh, and it's different kind of holding that anger here versus there. Because mm-hmm. my fear is that I may lose someone potentially, right. but their fear is that I could die right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, there's a difference in, in that too, of course. But I think I think the, the way people are dealing with it. I think any way they're dealing with it is right and justified. So whether you're so angry out there every day or whether you're choosing to practice, um, you know, tradition, like, t- like traditional teachings of Buddha and trying to find uh, the most peaceful way to do this thing. I think any reaction, any action is justifiable and that there's no kind of one true truth or one way to act uh, and react to this situation. Um, But I would say it's true that the lid has really Mm. come off. And it also, you know, weirdly the, like how social media has been actually helping people express that Mm -hmm. in a way that um, I have not seen before in past revolutions and right. You know, it hasn't been connected. Right. Uh, because now I think the reason why people feel maybe more connected and whatnot is because, you you know, when you see a picture of this young girl who is a, a watermelon vendor giving her, you know, food away, it's just inspiring to so many other people before that kind of emotion, that kind of virtue is not really visibly shared amongst millions of people people maybe like through a newspaper right um now doesn't exist because only government uh media is present in terms of print and um, on tv channels most people are relying on the internet and social media to get their news and whatnot so i think that kind of outlet has sort of created a better way to not only express your emotions your anger but also 
to feel connected with others who are feeling the same way that you are. Um, yeah. Right. And I want to go back to something you'd said before where you were talking about any expression is okay right now, whether mm -hmm. it's a, an expression of of traditional Buddhist concepts or whether it's something else. And I actually want to push back against that a little bit because <laughs> what I've been seeing is that the, in my experience, the people that are engaging with this in a very traditional Buddhist way mm -hmm. are also expressing their emotions very honestly and vulnerably. Yeah, and so definitely. it's, it's, yeah. it's not, I don't, I haven't seen any dichotomy with mm -hmm. that. And that's, what's been so extraordinary is that mm -hmm. people I've spoken to that have a deep commitment of nonviolence that are practicing meditation, even through this and sending mm -hmm. and striving to send metta not only to the protesters but also to everyone in the military as well mm -hmm. acknowledging the the difficulty of doing so but are trying even as they engage with this there's also a certain honesty and raw vulnerability mm -hmm. in how they're actually feeling even when that feeling is hopeless, when that feeling right. is wanting to scream or cry or, mm -hmm. or there's no resolution in sight, just the mere holding of that first noble truth of suffering and personalizing that first noble truth of suffering mm -hmm. into saying, I, I have this pain and things are not okay. And mm -hmm. whatever they're doing while they hold that, that view, that's something that in a society where there is um, encouragement towards harmony mm -hmm. and things being okay and forbearance, that mm -hmm. that forbearance seems like it's gone out. The, even even as they're holding Buddhist concepts, that forbearance mm -hmm. has gone out the window. Yeah, right, right, right. And that's yeah. incredible. And that's incredible. Right. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't meaning to say like, oh, you know, if people, I, I wasn't trying to say that people are not pushing it back against their own angers and feelings. It's, I think um, what, what I was meaning to say is just more trying to like, kind of encourage that, you know, no matter what, what your background is, where you're from. And yeah, like just, just saying that whatever you feel is, it's okay to right. feel that way. You know, sometimes maybe some people maybe like, I don't know, some like a turmoil within them, themselves that like, oh, I, I shouldn't be feeling that way and, mm. you know, whatnot, just not bringing it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just, no, yeah. you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. So, you know, another th interesting thing here is that when you talk about this agency, there's an agency mm -hmm. to feel and there's an agency to express how one feels, even if, that's not going to make the situation better or more harmonious, that there's there's a, an acceptance and openness to being able to just say how you feel at this moment. And I'm also mm -hmm. curious, like, where that agency is going in terms of Buddhism, where it's going in terms of monasticism, because it seems like, and again, I, I want to preface all this by saying I'm an, I'm an outsider, I'm not fluent mm -hmm. in the language. Um, so it's just kind of like a, um, some, some rough thoughts or a theory and, and I'm sharing it more to get your take on mm -hmm. this brainstorm that's starting to develop in me. Yeah. And it goes something like this, that in the past, this, the way this kind of traditional harmony and respect and everything was playing out was that monks who were supposed to be revered and monastics and monasteries and everything else, there was just a, a natural set of a uh, natural kind of reverence that was supposed to go with that. Maybe unthinking, maybe maybe more of a religious quality in, in looking at, well, if he's, if he's at this level, there must be some reason for it. And let me defer. And let me say that deference is an absolutely beautiful quality. Deference is not a quality I, I, you find very often at all in the West. And it's something right. that is sorely lacking. And I can go on and on about this. I won't, but let me just say that the, 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 um, benefits that I've learned from the qualities of deference in Myanmar mm -hmm. is really, really a beautiful, wonderful thing. However, it can also be placed in kind of an unthinking role where you just defer because that's what everyone is supposed to do. And in this current moment, when you're looking at agency, it's not just the agency of speaking how you feel at a given mm -hmm. time, even when it, 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 it's nothing good to share, but it's, mm -hmm. it's truthful. I'm also curious how that agency is playing out in terms of the lay monastic relationship. It's more like, what kind of monkhood do you want? What kind of monkhood is the one that's serving us? And that's another form of agency. That's another form of looking at what monastics and monks really have your interest at heart and are really 
behind you spiritually and ethically in their role as a religious clergy and which ones one has been showing reverence for, Mm -hmm. but in this tense time is, uh, are not exactly the ones that are, um, are, are are with those goals of the people. And this is such a curious thing because mm-hmm. the monkhood is set apart. It's not, and this is something I think Westerners don't understand, by intention, it's not supposed to be worldly. This is how the mm-hmm. Buddha set it up. You're not supposed to be engaged with politics. You're not supposed yeah. to be engaged with all the affairs of the world. And this is a really, really mm-hmm. beautiful thing. And it needs to stay this way. Yeah. However, there is a role, there is a kind of moral authority or spiritual protection that monks do have. And so, um, and so I'm just curious your thoughts on where the monkhood and the sangha and the lay monastic relations are mm-hmm. shaping in this time. And is this also something that's in a moment of, uh, mm-hmm. of reformulation? Yeah. I mean, it not only just now, you know, just even back in 2007, when thousands and thousands of monks out on the street protesting against this government and being beaten to death and being killed. I'm I'm sure like since then it has started shifting uh, in terms of kind of the monks involvement in like normal people things, you know, like politics and all the social issues. And just traditionally too, in an interesting way, because a lot of these famous monks and whatnot, to some degree, hold some kind of power. Sure. Although that's that's not what Buddhist monks are supposed to do. But in some ways, they're because things they say are taken as like a whole belief system by a lot of people. So, so the power they hold, uh, you know, at least used to be. Uh, at least for people in older ge- generations, things that come up come out of their mouth can change the mentality of the whole movement. Oh yeah, and, or things and, they don't say. Yeah, or things. Yeah, the, like the fact that if maybe they're staying silent about injustice and whatnot. But the majority of monks, you know, just two thousand seven is an exa- example to has already started shifting their way of being in terms of you know, not be, not not involved in politics, not involved in social issues, don't engage in violence. Um, you know, now, like, monks would even hide the protesters from, you know, being hunted down, or they would help give out their resources to build these barricades and help with whatever they have. And I don't think the traditional just scripture of how what, no, not only just scripture, just written or unwritten rules about what monks should be has changed. I think since 2007, you know, because yeah, we can claim that because they have some sort of spiritual protection, but they did back in 2007, you know, that's, I mean, that again, that's one of the tra- traumatic things for me too, because if you see just the piece of robe but Burmese Buddhists were told to just bow down towards a danga. We're not even supposed right. to step on their shadow if you know the sun's coming this mm-hmm. way and their shadow's casting. We were supposed to avoid avoid it or just stop walking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and if when you grow grew up in a country like that and you see these monks being beaten to death mm-hmm. for speaking up the truth. Mm-hmm. You're not going to feel like you're ever protected from anything. So right. I think it, the same goes to all the monks. Too. Yeah, you, they, they, they can keep practicing meditation and trying to find their inner peace and preach um, these Buddhist sermons if they're under a, mili- a military dictatorship because they're going to be censored as well. You know, because like even seeing some, I feel like some Buddhist, true Buddhist virtues and whatnot could go against what the military is saying or what the military is wanting to do to the people. Because in many ways, religion can inspire people to speak up and take action on things that are not just, and that's what they're fearful of. And that's what I believe that they've been trying to 
control people with uh, a form, of, you know, with religion, with quote unquote Buddhism, that I think they have crafted themselves not does not reflect um, the truth about Buddhism, true Buddhism, or what these Buddhist monks have been practicing. So yeah, for sure, I think that kind of relationship between people and monks could also change coming up, you know, like, I mean, even a lot of people might be saying, we, of course, re respect the monks, but it's not like bowing on my knees and just being so mm -hmm. scared of talking, you know, back to a monk. Mm -hmm. I, feel, you know, I feel like a lot of people my age would ask a, lo a logical question to a, mm -hmm. a monk and kind of, you know, be go still respectful, but, right. you know, be able to go back and forth and express their ideas. So yeah, that dynamic can definitely change as just of generally how people perceive. Right. So there could be some kind of reformulation mm -hmm. of that relationship, still keeping it in that sacred space. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting because when you mentioned the thing about not stepping on a monk's shadow, there's mm -hmm. nothing in the scriptures about that. <laughs> there's nothing in the Buddha's rules about that. Right. <laughs> That's entirely a Burmese Buddhist cultural belief. And yeah. actually a funny story, I was once with a with a French monk who encountered that belief actually for the first time. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was in robes for many, many years. And he was trying to convince these villagers that this is absolutely not true. They wouldn't buy into it just because they they had been taught this all their life. So like as we were walking in like late afternoon sunshine, when your shadow gets longer, mm -hmm. and there were kids on kind of the other side of the field, he kept walking and contorting his body in such ways that his shadow would bounce onto where the kids were walking, <laughs> kind of to, kind of to tease them. So the kids right, would get right, like right. really freaked out, and they, you know, like jump and run away. And then he would stretch his arm out so that you know his mm -hmm. his arm shadow like hit that. Mm -hmm. Just it, and they understood what it was, but it was it was just a kind of way to get at you know like right. I am a Buddhist monk and I have studied everything. And let me tell you, absolutely positively, there's nothing in the scriptures that say this. Right. But because they were raised that way. They couldn't really understand it. And so there's, um, you know, there is a way to keep the sacredness of what it means to have a monastic clergy, which, believe me, is, is coming from this country. It is something so profound to have mm -hmm. these people living to these vows of renunciation, yeah. of this uh, reciprocal relationship that the Buddha set up 2,500 years ago of the, mm -hmm. the people giving them, uh, giving them sustenance every day. Mm -hmm. taking care of their needs of clothing and food and medicine, not having to worry about that. And in return, these people being able to live a noble, and spiritual and ethical life where they are able to use the wisdom they gain from this pure living to inform and to help and to advise the, the lay practitioners and the lay people. Right. And there's something really, really special about this. But, you know, at the at the same time, there, there have been other beliefs that have crept into that, mm -hmm. that, um, that have changed that. And so you can, there's a way to go back to the core of how those teachings came across and to integrate that into what your community and culture is, mm -hmm. uh, that might look different than how it is now, but I'm, you know, I'm really, I guess I want to say cautiously hopeful that there is a roadmap for that, for being mm -hmm. able to, to not have a materialistic Western influence start to change some of those real beautiful things about yeah. Burmese Buddhist culture, while at the same time not having to be stuck in the past of the way things always were and the way things, mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there are some foreigners that do appreciate, the foreign practitioners, I should say, that do appreciate the traditional forms of Burmese Buddhist practice without realizing that those forms were traditional because they were held in place and paralyzed by a dictatorship that didn't allow any change. Right. And so how can the lid come off where, and, and even the, the shape of the practice and culture start to change, but the core of those beautiful beliefs and spiritual practices can still find very much a home in the new generation. Mm, absolutely. So... So yeah, I've taken so much of your time and thank you so <laughs> much for um, for chatting. I mean, this has been so valuable and I think that, you know, for, for people listening, I think it's been very educational as well. And so I'm wondering um, if there's anything you want to leave listeners with, especially people who are not from Myanmar and trying to understand it better, people that are wanting to help right now, people that are wanting to understand right now, what 
message would you have for them to better inform them about what is going on, something that's being missed, and Mm -hmm. what they could do? Yeah, well, um, I mean, one thing you could do is just listen and listen and listen, I think is the first step to take, you know, whether you're really unfamiliar with the country uh, or you know, whether, you know, you've been to the country a couple times, you've visited and had your great summer vacation there, mm. or you have deep connections like you do, you know, with uh, people from Burma. Yeah, like the first step is to just listen and also kind of as much as you can try to remove the knowledge, existing knowledge that you may have about the country or ex- mm. existing assumptions that you may have about the country. You know, I mean, the internet communication is not very great back home because it's being cut out. But if you can you know, talk to a Burmese person, um, of course, that's not the easiest thing to do. But, you know, there are a lot, a lot of... Uh, uh, news, not just like, you know, the foreign, like New York Times and BBC and whatnot. Um, sometimes there are a lot of uh, helpful, resourceful, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but mm. like right now, Facebook is sort of my most reliable mm. <laughs> form of news because I'm seeing mm. live updates from people from the ground. Mm-hmm. And as you know, so there are a lot of uh, social media accounts like on Instagram, listen up Myanmar is a account that uh, really explains the current situation and, you know, it, and it's written by uh, uh, people from Myanmar. So the, the perspective is uh, more or less more ac- accurate than, you know, uh, some foreign journalist writing about the su- situation. So try to right. read right. as many news sources as you can. Um, it's what would be my suggestion. You know, there are a lot of people who say you can actually talk to uh, your local um, government representative, you know, and so senators and whatnot, sending them letters about like uh, support that you, you know, you want to give or trying to prompt them to take action towards uh, that. Uh, I mean, I know like the U.S. has already kind of, you know, said that they're going to post some sanctions or there are some actions that are going to be taken towards this. Um, yeah, so you can, that's something else that you can do. There's a lot of uh, uh, fundraisers that are going on. I think there's a website called Mutual Aid Myanmar where mm-hmm. you can uh, see all the areas that need uh, some sort of financial support for people who are in in civil disobedient uh, movement, as well as uh, people who are out uh, protesting. You know, uh, can I think there's a lot, lot of different uh, contexts set up to like fundraise for various needs. Uh, so if you go to mutual com, I think uh, you can see, well, you can donate to see where your funds are going. But it's currently the banking situation is icky because even if we make donations from here, it's hard for people to withdraw money in, immediately. So, don't, so, you know, don't just donate to any GoFundMe that right. you see, like, you know, uh, try to talk to the organizers about the situation for you. Um yeah, and then also educate your friends and family about it. You know, try to start a conversation about it whenever you can with someone else just to raise awareness. Because, you know, I think revolutions like this, it's not, not only just um, Myanmar, but I think can inspire a lot of change in the world. Um, just to see and hear kind of, not only the news, but very personal stories about how these people are standing up for themselves, and I feel like can um, make a lot of positive change in different movements that are going around the world, as well as you know here in the U.S. I mean, I'm trying to stay up to date with what's going on here as much as I mean. My priority is, of course, now just about home, but doesn't mean that. A lot of the injustice and inequality we have here in the United States has just poof and 
gone away, you know, uh, sorry, went away. So um, I, I hope people can take, uh, you know, Burma as an example and I don't know, spread awareness about this and hopefully can inspire the way, I don't know, you're living your life as a person and trying to ponder about what you can uh, do as a person to foster positive changes. And this is a moment where this small crack of freedom is still open. You know, this is a moment where momentum really matters. You know, momentum is what creates things. Momentum is what has the UN ambassador defect on live TV. Mm-hmm. Momentum is what has ASEAN start the the, the, the the Asian countries that are in Southeast yeah. Asia, that network. It's what momentum is what create what has ASEAN start to look at a stricter statement and possible actions as they did just a couple mm-hmm. days ago, at least when we're recording this. Momentum is what has uh, given the motivation for uh, a monk of some standing to write an open letter that we published on our blog Mm -hmm. expressing his displeasure with what's happening and the need to protect human life. So all of these things, the conversation that we're having between the two of us, the listeners that are taking the time to be informed and then sharing this or talking about the concepts or looking elsewhere, all of these things that we are doing outside and that are happening inside, there are all these small ways that are going into the momentum of the movement while that small crack of freedom is still there. And I have really come to be a big believer in the last week that this momentum actually does things. It actually does create space for more people to step in it and for organizations and people to take greater risks. And every day is just so critical in terms of how we're able to keep that momentum alive. And there is a role for all of us to play, whether that's volunteering, whether that's donation, which are the which are the obvious things, or whether it's just talking to people, whether it's just finding, going online to some platform and making a Burmese friend and just asking them about their day and letting them know that you support them, letting them know that that you're with them and giving them just a little more energy for the hard work of protesting. It could be something as small as that. All of those things do go towards creating this momentum into this current moment and trying to you know, keep the freedom uh, that these people are 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 trying to uh, themselves to not let go of, and that we can be involved in in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. So, thank you so much for taking this time with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. You know, not it's kind of healthy for me to just let out uh, my thoughts to just. You know, not not to be like oh my life is so hard but it's it, it is true that you know um, a lot of my friends and family including me have been you know, going through through this and it's just uh yeah I'm I'm glad that I have a place to be vulnerable and mm-hmm. talk about my trauma and hopefully that can uh you know have impact on some of our listeners out there and you know, that they can contribute to this positive change that I hope is coming in the horizon. I hope you found today's show as rewarding to listen to as we did to produce it. These are not easy times. I certainly know this on a very personal level, as some of you might also have picked up on from what I've shared on this and other episodes. These days, I'm now absorbed in doing all I can at every moment of the day and night to push through whatever is possible from this humble platform. As often might also be true for some of you at this time, this often involves decreased sleep hours and quick meals, all during heightened states of emotion. So if you found this or any other episodes we've done recently of value and feel this mission is a valuable one to continue, please consider supporting our effort by making a donation. As we have dramatically ramped up all of our efforts this month, we are only able to keep production at this level through the generous donations of listeners like you. If you would like to join in our mission to share the Dhamma from the Golden Land more widely, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Every cent goes immediately and directly to sustaining the programming. 
You can give right on our website via credit card by going to insightmyanmar.org slash donation or through PayPal by going to paypal.me slash insightmyanmar. We also take donation through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. In all cases, simply search Insight Myanmar on each platform and you'll find our account. Alternatively, you can also visit our website for specific links to any of these respective accounts, or feel free to email us at info at insightmyanmar.org. In all cases, that's Insight Myanmar, one word, spelled I-N-S-I-G-H-T-M-Y-A-N-M-A-R. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. Thank you for your kind consideration. You have been listening to the Insight Myanmar podcast. We would appreciate it very much if you would be willing to rate, review, and or share this podcast. Every little bit of feedback helps. If you're interested, you can also subscribe to the Insight Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, please check out our website for a list of our complete episodes, including additional text, videos, and other information. All of it is available at insightmyanmaroneword.org. If you cannot find our feed on your podcast player, please let us know and we'll assure that it can be offered there in the future. There certainly was a lot to talk about in this episode, and we'd like to encourage listeners to keep the discussion going. Make a post, request a specific question, and join in on discussions on our Insight Myanmar podcast Facebook group. You are also most welcome to follow our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts by the same name. If you're not on Facebook, you can also message us directly at info at insightmyanmar.org. If you'd like to start up a discussion group on another platform, let us know, and we can share that platform here. Finally, we're open to suggestions about guests or topics for future episodes, so if you have someone or something in mind, please do be in touch. We would like to take this time to thank everyone who made this podcast possible. Currently, our team consists of two sound engineers, Martin Combs and Thar Nghe. There's, of course, Zach Hessler, content collaborator and part-time co-host, Ken Pransky helps with editing, and a special Mongolian volunteer who is asked to remain anonymous does our social media templates. In light of the ongoing crisis in Myanmar, a number of volunteers have stepped up to lend a hand as well, so we'd like to take this time to appreciate all of their efforts in our time of need. We'd also like to thank everyone who assisted us in arranging for the guests who have interviewed so far. And of course, we send a big thank you to the guests themselves for agreeing to come and share such powerful personal stories. Finally, we're immensely grateful for the donors who made this entire thing possible. We also remind our listeners that the opinions expressed by our guests on the show are their own and not necessarily reflective of the host or other podcast contributors. Please also note, as we are mainly a volunteer team, we do not have the capacity to fact check our guest interviews. By virtue of being invited on our show, there's a trust that they will remain truthful and not misrepresent themselves or others. If you have any concerns about the statements made on this or other shows, please contact us. This recording is the exclusive right of Insight Myanmar podcast and may not be used without the expressed written permission of the podcast owner, which includes video, audio, written transcripts, or excerpts of any episode. It is also not meant to be used for commercial purposes. On the other hand, we are very open to collaboration. So if you have a particular idea in mind for sharing any of our podcasts or podcast-related information, please feel free to contact us with your proposal. If you would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give by searching Insight Myanmar on PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, GoFundMe, and Patreon, as well as via credit card on our page at insightmyanmar.org donation. And with that, we're off to work on the next show, so see you next episode.